Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all very much. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you, and uh, I want to thank your chancellor for giving me the opportunity to be here with you, and uh, as well as the board, and it's a wonderful honor and pleasure to be with you today, particularly on this very special time when we, uh, we remember our veterans, uh, the men and women that have served this nation in uniform. And by the way, I see we have a Marine over here, so since tomorrow is the Marine birthday, happy birthday to the Marine Corps. Okay. And uh, I just want to let you know that when I saw you over there in uniform, I immediately went back and took all the big words out of my presentation. Okay. All right. I'm a uh, I'm a special forces guy, and I must tell you that the only people that have a, a reputation for uh, not being too bright uh, are the Marines and the special forces. So I'm going to tell you a story about the special forces guy. We had this uh, special forces non-commissioned officer that wanted to go to OCS. So he went to see his captain. His captain said, yeah, go study all weekend. When you come back in on Monday, I'll give you a test to see if you can get into the officer candidate school. So he got all his special forces teammates together and they all started studying and they studied hard all weekend and his teammates were coaching them and all. And uh, he brought him in Monday morning and the captain really liked this guy and he really wanted him to go to uh, the officer candidate school. So he thought, I'll make it easy on him. So he says, uh, he says to him, listen, I uh, said, I'm gonna give you one word uh, uh, to spell here and that's gonna be the only thing I'm gonna do on the test. And he said, oh, wow. Uh, spelling's not really my strongest suit, but uh, okay, go ahead. And all his buddies came in and gathered around the walls and the captain thought, I'm going to really make this easy. He said, spell army. Oh, he started sweating bullets. A R. He's looking at his buddy and they're going, come on, come on, come on. M Y. And all his buddies looked at the captain and said, oh, give him another chance. Folks, I'm going to talk to you today not as students of Liberty University. And by the way, Dr. Rodenheiser, it's good to see you again. And I think the first time I came here was with one of these groups that you brought down here from the D.C. area. So it's great. It's good to see you. Um, I'm not going to talk to you as students at Liberty University. And uh, this is a wonderful place. I love it here. But I'm going to talk to you about uh, people of faith. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about... Uh, as, as people who have made a commitment to Jesus Christ. Because I believe today that as we look at our nation and we look at what's happening in our nation, the only hope for America is that people of faith will rise up and become the salt and light that God created this nation to be. I will tell you that I don't, uh, I, I'm sure I don't have to tell this audience that America's in trouble. You see, you're all here with great expectations and aspirations for the future. But unless we make some substantial changes in America, there will be no future. Certainly not the future that I and these veterans that you've seen around here today have grown up with. It is up to us, people of faith, to rise up like a mighty army, to put our faith into action. Now let me say to you, there's probably nobody in this place that has been more criticized by the media than me. I don't like that. I don't, uh, I don't wear it as a badge of honor, but I also say that to tell you that there used to be a sign out here, and it may still be here, which says the politically incorrect university. Is that still out there? Not there, but we still are. But, but this is still a politically incorrect university, and I am not into political correctness, so I hope that you will bear with me today in the things that I say. Yes, because they come from the heart. They come from what I really believe. And my wife and I have decided that because we have six grandchildren, that we will spend the rest of our lives trying to ensure that the liberties that we've grown up with are preserved for our grandchildren. Now, I want uh, to remind all of you veterans, all of you veterans, I want you to stand up. All you veterans and active duty people, stand up very quickly. 
Now this, I don't want you to applaud for him. This is what I want you to do. I want you to repeat this after me. I do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And I take this obligation freely, without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. So help me God. While you are standing, let me remind you that the documents you signed when you took that obligation, when you took that oath, there was no expiration date on it. And you are expected to continue to support and defend the Constitution of the United States. So my charge to you is don't forget your oath. God bless you. You may be seated. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I am very concerned about the direction of this nation, but my punchline is if we as a nation of believers, if we as Christians, if we as people who have committed our lives to Jesus Christ will rise up and come together, we have nothing to fear in the future. There is nothing that can stop us as the church of Jesus Christ. The problem is that in America today, we have compromised the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when I talk about having compromised the gospel and I talk about the body of Christ, I'm not talking about Liberty University, but I'm talking about the church in America, the body of Christ in America. We have so compromised the gospel. Let me remind you of this. There is only one God. There is only one gospel and there is only one way to eternity with God. And that is through the gospel of Jesus Christ. The only hope for America is that we rise up as a mighty army, an army of God. Don't give up on America. America will be saved because I believe that Christians are waking up. I believe that people of faith are waking up all over this nation. But I will tell you, it has been slow in company. And I think that people are starting to realize that the only hope for America is the Christian church. You have an obligation as a Christian. You also have an obligation as an American to stand for your faith. You have an obligation to get involved in what's going on in this nation. You can't sit on the sidelines anymore. Too many Christians have sat on the church pews and decided that they would let someone else determine the future of this nation. You can't do that anymore. Now you have to put your faith into action and you have to be part of the solution. The question is, when you leave this university, what will you do? It's fairly clear what you're gonna do while you're here, but when you leave this university, what are you gonna do? What are you gonna do with your life? How are you gonna live your life to make a difference in America? These veterans, all these people that stood up, these that are serving today, these that stood up that said, I'm a veteran, they've committed their lives to service to the nation. They've served proudly and they will continue to serve. But what about all the rest? We have an obligation as Christians to stand in the gap for this nation. You know, the Bible says, seek the welfare of the nation in which God has put you. That means that we as Christians have an obligation to get involved in what's going on in this nation. Do you realize that the liberties that were articulated in the Constitution of the United States, every one of those liberties came out of a sermon that was preached in the 13 colonies. Every one of them. The gospel of Jesus Christ had the most important impact on the founding of this nation. And today we see a compromise of that gospel all over our nation. In 1773, the British coined a term that you are probably familiar with called the Black Robe Regiment because of the men in black robes that continually influenced the founding fathers of America. And those men in black robes were pastors. You realize that the Bible was referenced four times more than any other document in the Constitution of the United States. Oh, there are people today that are trying to rob us of that identity, the identity of the Judeo-Christian base upon which we were founded. But it's a historic fact. America was founded on Judeo-Christian principles. And all the historians that try to change that are absolutely wrong. Do you know that the 56 men that signed that Declaration of Independence were all men of faith? 
when they walked into Philadelphia on the 2nd of July, 1776, and signed their names and drew big targets on their own chest, knowing that they would ultimately be executed. If they were not successful, they would be executed as traitors to the crown of England. We were founded on Judeo-Christian principles, and it is important that we keep reminding ourselves of that. This was founded by men that believed in the divinity of Jesus Christ. The church was the conscience of our society when this nation was founded. Remember, it was the church that brought about the second great awakening that brought an end to slavery. It cost us thousands of lives, but it was the church that ultimately drove America to rise up against this great evil in our country. Today, we've got Christians that are afraid of being persecuted or criticized by the media or by their friends or something else. Let me tell you something to all of you. You better get over that. You better get beyond that. You better get to the point where you understand that you ultimately answer to God, not to man, not to the media, not to the leadership of this nation. You answer to God. And it is important that we reflect on the fact that we will stand before Him one day and give an account. It is a time of political correctness that is destroying this nation. We worry more about offending someone than we do about spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ in America. You see, these veterans, they never went into battle where they didn't respect the enemy, but also they never went into battle where they didn't expect to win. And I'm saying to you all today, we need to all be veterans. We need to be veterans in God's army. We need to be veterans in an army that is larger than the U.S. Army, that is larger than the U.S. military, and that's God's army. Churches today in America are concerned about their 501c3 status. Well, let me tell you something that you may not be aware of. First of all, churches don't need 501c3. And your law school here, Matt Staver, is one that is trying to explain that to churches and pastors all over the nation. You don't have to have a 501c3 to begin with. And when you look at the history of where that came from, what you realize is it was a very nefarious act by a guy named Lyndon Johnson who wanted to punish the church for not supporting him in 1948 when he created this 501c3. And then the churches all jumped on the bandwagon only to realize that there was a fine print There was some fine print that they hadn't read up front. Churches are not in need of a 501c3. Today, the church has lost its moral authority. The church has ceded its authority to the ACLU and Code Pink and MoveOn.org and ACORN. And even today, the Occupy Wall Street. Has anybody in here yet figured out what they want Is there anybody that can explain to me what they want? I can't figure it out. But the church has ceded its authority to these other organizations where the church ought to be the most fundamental influence in America because of political correctness. We've ceded that authority to these other organizations. It's time for us to come back and take over our country and become the salt and light that God's called us to be. As they were As the Congress was working through the whole issue of the don't ask, don't tell repeal, which would allow homosexuals to serve in our military very openly, the guy that led the fight was a guy named John McCain. And John McCain kept going to Tony Perkins at the Family Research Council and saying, Tony, where's the church? Where are the spiritual leaders? Why won't they come along beside me and work with me on this and stand up and speak out on this issue? church has compromised itself. So America is losing its identity. Let me tell you what can happen when this nation loses its identity. Look at Europe. If you look at what's happening in Europe today, that all the experts will tell you that by the middle of this century, Europe will be an Islamic continent. Do you realize that? Europe will be an Islamic continent. And why? The reason is because Europe made the same decisions 20 years ago that we're making today in this nation. 
But more importantly, Europe lost its identity. And that identity was the Judeo-Christian base upon which those nations were founded. If you look at Greece today, all the things that are going on in Greece, all the riots, all the upheaval, the fact of the matter is the gospels were written in Greek because Greece was such an important nation and the language was so important for culture and trade and arts. And then all of a sudden, the Greeks decided it was not fashionable, it was not politically correct to identify themselves as Christians. And today, less than 8% of the people in Greece identify themselves as regular churchgoers. They lost their identity. And England has exactly the same problem. And if you look at England and all the revivals that came out of England and all the great ministers that came from England, and you realize that today in the city of London, there are areas that you don't go into unless you're a Muslim. They're called Sharia zones where you can't go unless you're a Muslim. There are places in France, 787 no-go zones in France today where the police and the firefighters don't go because they're controlled by the imams. And what happened in England, what happened in England was that they lost their identity because they walked away from their faith because it was no longer fashionable or politically correct to be a Christian. And less than 10% of the people in England today are Christians or are professing Christians that go to church on a regular basis. You know, the same thing is happening in America. It's time for us to step up and put our faith into action. In fact, this whole issue of separation of church and state has been so misconstrued and turned upside down. Do you realize that there was a man named Hugo Black that was a Supreme Court Justice that was a member of the Ku Klux Klan who made a ruling in 1947 that turned the whole issue of separation of church and state upside down. There is no such thing in our Constitution as you're well aware, but Hugo Black wanting to punish the church made this ruling in 1947. The First Amendment was written to protect the church from the government, and in 1947, Hugo Black turned it upside down and it became a matter of protecting the government from the church. We need to get back to our basics. Today we've got this feel good gospel all over America where you stand up and you smile and you say everything's okay, I'm okay, you're okay, everything's going to be good. God wants you to have the very best of everything. You know what God wants you to have? God wants you to have a promise of eternity with Him if you've committed your life to Jesus Christ. But go preach that gospel in Africa where there's a great revival going on, but they're just trying to feed their families. Preach it to the underground church in China where people are coming to Christ in the numbers of about 30,000 a day. If it doesn't hold up in those places, then it's not the gospel of Jesus Christ. We've got others that have come up with this concept called Chrislam. How many of you have heard of Chrislam? It's where pastors are now saying that we all worship the same God, so Christianity and Islam worship the same God. And they come together and they worship together and they read from the Quran and they read from the Bible. And these are big churches and in many cases well-known pastors under this thing they call an interfaith dialogue. Let me tell you something, we don't all worship the same God. We don't worship the same God at all. My, my God. My God already paid the price for me that I might have the promise of eternity if I accept Him. The God of Islam is a harsh and brutal God, and only Allah can determine where you spend eternity. That's not the same God. My Jesus was not a prophet. My Jesus was the Messiah. My Jesus came as the Son of God. And now we have churches that are performing same-sex marriage and churches that are supporting abortion, and these are supposed to be Christian churches. I don't understand how you find any support for that in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Anywhere in God's Word, I don't see where there's any justification for supporting that. Folks, Christians have to rise up in America. People of faith have to rise up. We're the only hope. I want you to think about the fact that Exodus 15, 3 says, the Lord is what? 
The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. And in Revelation 19, it says that when Jesus returns, he's coming back as a mighty warrior, riding on a white horse with a blood-stained robe, leading a mighty army. Exodus 15, 3, the Lord is a warrior. Revelation 19, he's coming back as a warrior. Is there not some expectation that we, as Christians in the body of Christ, will be the warriors in God's kingdom until he returns? We have to be warriors, spiritual warriors. I'm not talking about taking up arms against our nation. Every time somebody comes to me and says, when do we take up arms? I want to knock them out and test my sanctification, Chancellor. <laughs> I want to knock them out. You don't take up arms against your own nation. But as Christians, as the body of Christ, we rise up like a mighty army and we begin to be the salt and light that God called us to be. God created civil government. People say Jesus never got involved in politics, so neither will I. Well, let me tell you something. Jesus challenged every law of the land. Jesus was a warrior. Jesus went into the, to Jerusalem and challenged everything that they believed there. And this nonsense about Christians shouldn't get involved in politics is just that, it's nonsense. Christians should be taking the lead in politics. Christians should be the foundations of our politics. Because those men that founded this nation were men of faith. They were men that believed that Jesus was the Messiah. And they were men that believed that God had a purpose and a mission for this new nation that they were created. Do you realize pastors, pastors were the dominant influence in the early days. How many of you have ever heard of John Peter Gabriel Muhlenberg? Right up here in Woodstock, Virginia, go up the Highway 81 and stop in Woodstock and see his little church. He was a man that graduated from his primary education and went to Europe. And he spent two years in Europe getting a theological degree. He was named John Peter Gabriel Muhlenberg because he was the son uh, and the grandson of pastors, of theologians, of men of the Word of God. And when he finished his theological degree, he came back and founded this church in Woodstock, Virginia. It was the 21st of January, 1776, and Pastor Muhlenberg went in his church about two hours early. All he had was his Bible. He sat down in his little office there and he began to read the Word of God and he began to pray. And he began to say, God, what would you have me do? And he would read the scripture, God, what would you have me do? And as it came time for the service to start, Pastor Muhlenberg heard a loud noise out in the auditorium there. He got up and he put on his robe and he walked out with his Bible in his hand and he walked up to the pulpit and he laid his Bible down and he looked and the place was packed. 21st of January, 1776. And Pastor Muhlenberg saw people standing all around the walls, every pew was filled. Pastor Muhlenberg, in fact, the back doors were open and people were standing outside listening to what Pastor Muhlenberg was going to say. Pastor Muhlenberg opened his Bible to Ecclesiastes 3 and he began to preach. There's a season for all things. As he came near the end of his sermon, he said, there's a time for peace and there's a time for war. And then he looked up at his audience and Pastor Muhlenberg said this, he said, the Bible tells us there's a time to preach and a time to pray. Well, the time for me to preach has gone away. Sound the drums, and the drummer began to beat the drum out in the back of his church there, and it was the drum roll of a recruiter for the Continental Army. And then Pastor Muhlenberg removed his robe to reveal the uniform of a colonel of the 8th Virginia Regiment. He walked out through the back door and he mounted his horse and he looked at the assembled men there and he said, and who among you will fight with me in this cause of liberty? He led 330 men through the Revolutionary War, achieving the rank of Major General. He was a theologian, but he understood that there were times when we had to fight. And I am telling you that now is a time that we have to fight, not with physical weapons, that's the duty of these veterans, these active duty people. But as Christians, we have to fight to save this nation. We have to rise up. We have to put our faith into action. 
And I will just tell you, if you're not quite there yet in terms of your faith, think about it. Think about it. Pray about it. Seek God's will in your life because now is a time when this nation needs you more than ever since the creation of America in 1776. Seek the welfare of the nation in which God has put you. That means we've got to get off the pews. It means we've got to get out and get in the action. And we start by doing this. We start by praying for America. You say, well, that's, yeah, that seems pretty obvious. No. Do you realize how many Christians don't pray for this nation? Every great revival in America has come out of a, a prayer of repentance. Right over here at Hampton Sydney College, there were two boys in the mid-1800s that were out in the woods praying. And as the weather got bad, they moved into the dormitory. And they were making so much noise as they prayed and as they worshiped God and as they sang songs and they sought God's will in their lives, the other students went to them and said, you gotta knock that off in here. And they said, we're not going to, we're seeking God. We're seeking God's will in our lives. They took them to the chancellor and said, these boys are making noise, they're disturbing all the other students. The chancellor brought them in and they said, knock it off. You've got to stop doing that. And they said, you can fire us, you can kick us out of school, but we will not stop seeking the Lord. And the chancellor didn't know what to do with them, so he sent them back to their dormitory and said, just tone it down. They continued praying and seeking God. And finally, other students began to go and, and listen in to what was happening in their room. And then they began to join them. And then a great revival broke out right here at Hampton Sydney College. A great revival broke out on that campus. Remember at one time it was a Presbyterian seminary. A great revival broke out. And people were coming to know Christ as their personal savior all over that campus because these two young men would not be silenced because they said, we are going to continue seeking God. And then those young men, when they graduated, they bought mules and they took their Bibles and they went across the Appalachian Mountains and those two young men became part of the foundation of what we know as the second great awakening as the church began to rise up. And there was a great revival in America that as I said earlier, ultimately brought an end to slavery. We need to come before the Lord every day asking that God would forgive us as a nation, that God would lead us out of the morass that we've gotten ourselves into. And I promise you, if America will come together and pray for God to guide and lead this country, there is no force in heaven that will stand against us. There is no force on earth that will stand against us, but God will come behind us and move us forward as a nation. The second thing is we need to vote. If you don't vote, don't ever complain about anything in America. I went down yesterday. You owe it to every one of these veterans that's fought, that served to defend this country. You owe it to them to get out there and vote and vote for leaders that share your values. You need to go out and help get people registered to vote. I'm not telling you what candidates to vote, vote your conscience, but it'll be pretty clear if you'll come before the Lord, you got to pray for people that demonstrate Christian values. Get behind candidates, help them. And by the way, some of you get out and run for office. When you get out of this institution, get out and run for office, get involved. Say to the Lord as Isaiah 6, 8 says, here am I, send me. But get out and get involved and run for office if that's what you're called to do. You need to call, write, and email your leaders. You know, my wife, this is my, my beautiful wife, I might add, she writes, calls, and emails our congressional leaders almost every day. They are so tired of hearing from her. And the other day at one of the football games over at Hampton, Sydney, the uh, staff assistant for our representative was there at the game and he sought her out and he said, Mrs. Boykin, we get the message. We get it. 
What he was saying was, would you stop writing? Would you stop calling? Would you stop pestering us? She does it every day. And don't think that it doesn't make a, a difference. Or we got to get involved with organizations that are trying to do something. Get involved with veterans organizations that are trying to help our veterans. Get involved with organizations that are trying to help our active duty military. Get involved with organizations that are trying to push traditional Christian values in this nation. And there are many that are doing just that. Get involved in what's going on in America. I'm going to finish with this. Many of you, I'm sure, are aware that I was a commander of the Delta Force during the events that we now know as Black Hawk Down. And the morning after we had that terrible firefight, the firefight occurred on the 3rd of October, 1993. And the next morning, as I sat on my bunk pondering the fact that we had just lost 15 of our soldiers and there were 72 more men wounded. I was pondering it with a very heavy heart and my Sergeant Major walked up to me and he said, sir, are you ready? I looked up at him and I nodded, I'm ready. I put my cap on and I followed him across the airfield there on the sands of Mogadishu and we got to the other side down the beach and there was a tent there and that tent had a sign across the top of it and it said, Mortuary Affairs. It was a morgue. And I, my Sergeant Major walked up and he pulled a flap back and he looked at me and he said, let's go. With a very heavy heart and a lump in my throat, I walked in through that flap and a young staff sergeant met me and said, sir, would you follow me? I followed her and she walked over to a big plastic bag. It was a body bag. And she unzipped that body bag and I looked into the cold ashen face of a soldier that only 24 hours earlier I'd been laughing and joking with and playing volleyball with. And she walked down the line and she unzipped 15 of those bags. And each time I looked into those bags, I asked myself this question. I said, did I do everything I could? Did I do everything I could to make sure this man came home, to make sure he was prepared, to make sure that he heard the gospel of Jesus Christ before he went into eternity? Did I do everything I could? Folks, let me tell you something. We're looking at a nation right now that if we don't do the right things, if we as the body of Christ don't rise up and become a mighty army and put our faith into action, we're gonna be doing exactly what I was doing on that airfield that day. We're gonna be looking in a body bag and that body bag is gonna be the body bag of America. And then it's gonna to be too late to say, did I do everything I could? Did I do everything I could? for this nation. It's a wonderful time of the year that we recognize and honor our veterans. I thank you all for your service. I thank you all for your attention today. May God bless you and may God bless America. Thank you.